Hi there and welcome to this day in history for January the 2nd. January the 2nd is the second day of the year in the Gregorian calendar. Most years there would be 363 days remaining until the end of the year, but this is a leap year, so there are 364 days remaining to the end of this year. Sanskrit is an ancient Indian language that has given many words to English directly, such as orange, nirvana, and mantra, and also indirectly, such as guru, ka, and jute by way of its daughter languages or by way of another language which borrowed them from Sanskrit such as Zen, candy, or lilac. We've been exploring words that have their origins in Sanskrit and today's word is mantra. Mantra is a noun which means a sound, a word, or a phrase that is repeated in prayer and is believed to have mystical powers. The word can also represent an often repeated word or phrase that is closely associated with something, such as a slogan, a byword, or a watchword. For example, as my children can attest, my mantra for years has been, go to work every day and pay your bills first. <laughs> the word mantra comes from Sanskrit mantra, which means thought or formula, ultimately from the Indo-European root men to think, which is the source of mind, mnemonic, mosaic, music, mentor, money, and Mandarin. Now moving on, before we get started, I want to mention that links to my research are included in the show notes. So if you're wondering where I got my information, check out those show notes. <laughs> I also want to say happy birthday to my friend and neighbor, Caitlin. <laughs> I hope you have an awesome year. And with that, we're going to start in the year 1776, when the Continental Congress published the Tory Act Resolution, which described how colonies should handle those Americans who remained loyal to the British and King George. You know, we were in the revolutionary days then. The act called on colonial committees to indoctrinate those honest and well-meaning, but uninformed people by enlightening them as to the origin, nature, and extent of the present controversy. The Congress remained fully persuaded that the more our right to the enjoyment of our ancient liberties and privileges is examined, the more just and necessary our present opposition to ministerial tyranny will appear. They had other things to say about people who remained loyal to the Tories and to King George, but you can look that up if you want to know more about it. In 1788, Georgia entered the Union when it voted to ratify the U.S. Constitution, becoming the fourth state in the modern United States. In 1811, the first censuring of a U.S. Senator. Senator Timothy Pickering, a Federalist from Massachusetts, became the first Senator to be censured when the Senate approved a censure motion against him by a vote of 20 to 7. Pickering was accused of violating congressional law by publicly revealing secret documents communicated by the President to the Senate. In 1890, President Harrison welcomes Alice Sanger as the first female staffer. Sanger's appointment may have been an olive branch to the growing women's suffrage movement that had been gathering momentum during Harrison's presidency. Whether or not Sanger actively supported women's suffrage has been lost in the historical record. However, Harrison's appointment of Sanger indicated a cautious step toward strengthening female representation in government. On January the 2nd of 1897, American writer Stephen Crane survives the sinking of the Commodore off the coast of Florida. He would turn the harrowing adventure into his classic short story, The Open Boat. American politician, businessman, and author Barry Goldwater was born on this day in 1909. Isaac Asimov was born on this day in 1920. He was an American writer. You may know that he was a writer of science fiction, but I didn't know before I did this research that he was also a professor of biochemistry. He was a prolific writer who wrote or edited more than 500 books and an estimated 90,000 letters and postcards. His books have been published in nine of the ten major categories of the Dewey Decimal classification. And as to that career in biochemistry, it turns out that he simply made more money writing than he did teaching biochemistry. 
On January 2nd of 1923, Secretary Fall resigned in the Teapot Dome scandal. Albert Fall, the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Interior, resigned in response to public outrage over the Teapot Dome scandal. Fall's resignation illuminated a deeply corrupt relationship between Western developers and the federal government. On this day in 1936, American singer, songwriter, musician, and actor Roger Miller was born. I always think of his song, King of the Road. In 1940, the American televangelist Jim Baker was born. That guy's got some story on him, too. On this day in 1947, American zoologist and author Jack Hanna was born. I remember him from uh, the old Johnny Carson days. He would come on Johnny Carson with some wild animal to show the audience. <laughs> those, are some, those are some priceless episodes right there. Oh my goodness, on January 2nd, 1958, opera star Maria Callas walked out of a performance. Now she said that she was sick, but... She was given to fits of temper and real prima donna behavior. The president of Italy and most of Rome's high society were in the audience, and since she was known for her volatile temperament, she was sharply criticized for this. And it was a characteristic move for the Greek-American diva who packed as much drama into her personal life as she did on stage. On January 2, 1962, a folk group called the Weavers were banned by NBC after refusing to sign a loyal the oath. They were one of the most significant popular music groups of the post-war era, and they saw their career nearly destroyed during the Red Scare of the early 50s. Even with anti-communist fervor in decline by the early 60s, the Weavers' leftist politics were used against them. As late as January 2, 1962, when the group's appearance on the Jack Parr show was canceled over their refusal to sign an oath of political loyalty. In 1967, former movie actor and future president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, was sworn in as governor of California. 1968, American actor and producer Cuba Gooding Jr. was born. In 1974, on January 2nd, President Nixon signed a bill lowering the maximum U.S. speed limit to 55 miles an hour in order to conserve gasoline during an OPEC embargo. OPEC stands for the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries and is based on the other side of the planet. They're always bickering with each other and most of the rest of the world, and so they placed an embargo. At the time, we got a lot of our petroleum from over there, and when you're not getting the petroleum, you can't really turn it into gasoline. So, President Nixon signed a federal law lowering all national highway speeds to 55 miles an hour. The act was intended to force Americans to drive at speeds deemed more fuel efficient, thereby curbing the U.S. appetite for foreign oil. Well, you may have heard Sammy Hager's song, I Can't Drive 55. Eventually, in 1987, Congress authorized states to reset speed limits within their borders, but proponents of the National Maximum Speed Limit Law claimed it lowered automobile-related fatalities, prompting Congress to keep it on the books until finally repealing it in November of 1995. Today's speed limits across the country vary between 35 and 40 in congested urban areas and 75 miles an hour on long stretches of rural highway. U.S. drivers now drive almost as fast as their European counterparts who average between 75 and 80 miles an hour on the highway. On some roads in Italy, it's legal to drive as fast as 95 miles an hour. Wowzers, I think I'd like to stay off that road. On January 2nd of 1980, President Carter reacted to Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. He requested that the Senate postpone action on the SALT II nuclear weapons treaty and recall the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union. These actions indicated that the U.S.-Soviet relationship had been severely damaged by Russian action in Afghanistan and that the age of detente had ended. In 1981, one of the largest investigations by a 
British police force ended when serial killer Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, was arrested in Sheffield, South Yorkshire. Oh my goodness, in 2009, a rare Bugatti was found in a British garage. A rare, unrestored 1937 Bugatti Type 57S Atalante Coupe had been found in the garage of a British doctor. A month later, on February 7, the car sold at Paris auction for some $4.4 million. Apparently, the doctor had purchased it and had it in his garage since the 1960s. He hadn't driven it in over 50 years. It had been built in 1937 and originally owned by Francis Richard Henry Penn Curzon, the fifth Earl Howe. In 2011, actress Anne Francis, what a stunner. She had pretty decent filmography, but I think my favorite role that she played was Honey West. She was known for a mole on her right next to her lip there. Real pretty girl. I've placed a link to the playlist of some episodes of Honey West in the show notes. This show ran on television in the 1960s, so there shouldn't be anything too awful for children to see if they're interested. Anne Francis died on this day in 2000. 2011 at the age of 80. And that's all I have for you today. As always, links to my research are included in the show notes. Thank you so much for watching. Give it a like if you enjoyed this video. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. And feel free to share. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Authoritarian and corrupt. My salmon's done. I'll be right back. <laughs> Barking dog. Alrighty. Back to work. Okie dokie, Smokey. Smoother. Be smoother. That's a lot of words. I'm going to have to look at that. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. Did not a man. See, this is what happens when we're not scripted. <laughs> This is why I don't do live shows. <laughs>